Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City. I'm the Reverend Monica Dobbins. I'm the assistant minister of this congregation, and it's a joy to see you all here this morning for a very special service put on by our worship arts team under the leadership of Kathleen Cahill. As always, we begin our worship with the lighting of the chalice, and so we do today. symbol of light and of knowledge, symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. Since we are doing a special service this morning, we'll begin with our announcements so that when we've completed them, we can dive right into the meat of the service. Uh, so I'd like to begin by announcing some good news. We're about 75% of the way through our pledge uh, drive. Uh, we're very glad for that 75%, and I want to thank each one of you who has completed your pledge for next year. And to those 25%, let's go ahead and get it in soon so that we can draw the pledge drive to a close and go ahead and start planning for next year. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to announce that tomorrow evening is Family Fun Night. This is our monthly opportunity for our families with kids to come together, have some fun, have some dinner, free dinner on a Monday night. You cannot pass that up and uh, learn something about Unitarian Universalism together. Then on April 15th, I'd like to welcome you to our new member ceremony. If you have joined the congregation in the past year, if you've signed the book, we want to honor you. If you'd like to join the congregation for the first time, this will be your big moment on April 15th. And if you sign the book that night, then you'll be eligible to vote in our congregational meeting in May. And if you are already a member and you're just really excited about the growth that our congregation is experiencing, I would really love to welcome you as well. That's April 15th. It's tax day. Easy to remember. 7 p.m. right here in Elliott Hall. Just a couple of a little bit longer announcements. First of all, today's service is about the experience of immigration. And it reminds us that immigrants are all around us people we know, our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends. I hope that today's service will be one that inspires you and encourages you to take action. And one of the most important ways that you can take action is to volunteer right here at First Unitarian Church in our sanctuary effort. We know that life can get busy and it can be easy to think that someone else is taking care of it. And you may have heard that we have over 200 volunteers, but the truth is that it's about 70 people who are doing the bulk of the work. We'd like to see more people involved, and believe me, it's a really rewarding experience. And I think that if every one of our members would just take one shift a month, we would have no problem covering all of the 24-7 shifts that protect and enrich the life of Vicky Chavez and her girls. So I encourage you, if you haven't volunteered in a while, please recommit yourself to this effort. We have volunteers in Elliott Hall this morning who would like to get you signed up for the first time or signed back up, uh, get you back into the effort. And finally, I have some sad news to share with you. Our congregation has lost three people this weekend who were members of this congregation in times past and up till today. Some of you may remember Flo Weinreiter, who was a member for a long, long time, retired and moved to St. George. And he died about a week ago on Sunday. Um, his memorial service will be here in Elliott Hall, April 8th, starting at 6 o'clock, and you are invited. Secondly, about a, about a week ago, Adeline Polvoy, 
who was a member here in the 70s and 80s, was a charter member of our congregation at South Valley, and then came back in the late 90s. Uh, she also died, and so we wanted you to know about that. And finally, this Thursday, our dear friend Margie Coombs died peacefully in her sleep. She will be deeply missed by her husband, Alan, and her children, and by our whole community. A memorial service is still being planned, and there will be plenty of notice so that you may attend and support this family in their time of grief. But for now, we remember these three members by briefly extinguishing the chalice and remembering them in silent prayer. Even when the light is snuffed out, it never goes out in our hearts. We remember those who have passed on from our sight. And we live for those who are still with us. May it be so. Amen. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit as we sing our opening hymn. Woyaya. The music is on the pew near you. Please join us. morning. Uh, my name is Kathleen Cahill. 
and I want to ask you to think of this. Tomorrow, you have to pack all you can into one suitcase and make a long, hard journey to a country where you don't speak the language, where they eat food you don't recognize, and where they might not welcome you. They might not like you. They might even hate you, but you go. You pick up your suitcase and you walk into this strange country for reasons of need and fear, but also for reasons of hope, possibility, and imagination. This experience belongs to every one of us sitting here this morning. It may not have happened to us directly, but it did to someone in our family, our deep family, our ancestors. Because America, as we know, but as we sometimes forget, is a country of immigrants. Here in the West, the Mormons don't identify as immigrants. They start their history with the struggle across the plains. But before they began that journey, they had an earlier one, in ships crossing the Atlantic. They were immigrants, full of fear and need and hope, imagination, and dreams of possibility. Those are the spirits of this country. That is the American dream. It's a dream of leaving what is for what could be. When I was growing up in the Northeast, I had, over the course of my adolescence, three best friends. Irene Apostolaris from a Greek family, Caroline Saltonstall, and Phoebe Bowditch who both proudly knew the name of the ship their immigrant family came over on way back in the 18th century. By the time I knew them, of course, they had stopped being immigrants. They thought of themselves as originators, as the real and true Americans. When I first met Caroline's mother, she asked me about my family. I said, we were Irish and Italian. She said, oh, immigrants. Time goes by, you stop thinking of yourself as an immigrant, and you may even start to feel superior to other immigrants because you got here first. My sister recently had her DNA tested and she learned that she was Irish and Italian and also that she had quite a lot of Neanderthal in her DNA. <laughs> I don't know when the Neanderthals came over. Today, our meeting together is dedicated to our common experience of being immigrants at one time or another. It's what we share as Americans. When we allow ourselves to turn our back on immigrants, we are really turning our backs on ourselves, our history, and the spirit of who we really are as a people and as a country. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and a life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. 
I am the immigrant, clutching the hope I seek, and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak, of grab the gold, of grab whatever ways of satisfying need, of owning everything for one's own greed. Yet I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a serf of kings, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lee, and torn from black Africa's strand, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Oh, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet, and yet must be. The land where everyone is free. The land that's mine. The poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain from those who live like leeches on the people's lives. We must take back our land again, America. We, the people, must redeem the land, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plains. All, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. I am Tim Chambliss, and this is my immigration story. I'm a US citizen with a French English last name, conceived in St. Louis, Missouri, and quickly as a migrant, I was born in Houston, Texas, a few hundred miles north of the border with Mexico. Since 1868, the 14th Amendment, Section 1 declares, I am a U.S. citizen because I was born in the United States. I inherited blonde hair and blue eyes from my mother. I inherited my height and my work ethic from my father. My folks together gave me my white skin. My folks were married when I was born. They talked often of moving. They were restless. They were migrants as were their ancestors. My English, Irish, French ancestors came to America over 250 years ago, 250 years before the 1885 Statue of Liberty. I can trace my Chambliss family history back 13 generations. My great-grandfather Dayton Chambliss was born in Georgia and only a year old was brought to Texas in cloth diapers in a covered wagon. His folks left Georgia just before the Civil War. In Georgia, his, 
His parents had owned a slave family. When they arrived in Texas to homestead, they had no slaves. What happened? I do not know. 1861 to 1865, I had four great uncles who fought for the South, the Confederacy, in the Civil War, or what my father called the War of Northern Aggression. One uncle surrendered with General Lee at Appomattox. That uncle is the older brother of my great-grandfather. They were later marry a mother and a daughter, my great-grandmother and my great-great-grandmother. Significantly, my great-grandmother's biological father was an American Indian in Texas. No marriage. My great-grandmother would later say she was white. My last name, Chambliss, what is its origin? Well, I have a theory, a theory I cannot prove. In 1603, Robert Chamblay was born and raised in a small village in northern France, a few kilometers from the English Channel. The names of his parents or any siblings are unknown. I cannot find them. Sometime before 1622, he entered England without a visa. Perhaps Normans, Celtics, Anglo-Saxons in England saw Robert Chamblay to be the outsider, the foreigner. And so Robert Chamblay anglicized his French name. He dropped the Y and added the letter S twice to end his French last name with an English religious word, bless, in the hope maybe of being accepted. So Robert Chamblay became Robert Chambliss. And at age 19 in 1622, he married an English woman, Joanne, and they had a son, John. Still, Robert Chambliss was the outsider, the foreigner. And so in 1652, he and his English wife and son immigrated to Virginia. They crossed the pond, and they did so without a visa. For 300 years, 12 generations of my Chambliss family were poor farmers, poor carpenters, lacking formal education. They migrated through Virginia and the Carolinas to Georgia and then on to Texas, where I was born. In the mid-1700s, my mother's star family immigrated to Virginia from England and Ireland. In Virginia and through Appalachia, they struggled as poor farmers, carpenters, failed business people. They migrated through Kentucky to the river town of St. Louis, Missouri. I can tell you they were not perfect. Some were lawbreakers. Some were just rascals. Somehow, they survived. And so today, who am I? I'm Timothy Mark Chambliss. My mother named me after her favorite two books in the Bible's New Testament, perhaps in the hope of keeping me from also becoming a rascal in her family's tradition. <laughs> today, I respect my late father, who encouraged me to become an educated man and I value his and my Native American ancestry and my French and English immigrant ancestors. Today, I identify with underdogs, with migrants, with immigrants. A wall is a symbol of fear and exclusion. The Statue of Liberty is America's welcoming symbol. Welcoming, not fear and hate, should be the spirit of America. Thank you.
Good morning. I'm Niru Ramkumar. Hi, I'm Sandeep. We are from India. How does one end up in Salt Lake City, Utah from Chennai, India? Our decision to pick Utah was largely academic. We researched the school thoroughly, so we knew a lot about the school, but we didn't know much about Utah. What other friends and family told us was neither accurate nor flattering. <laughs> I came across Salt Lake early in my childhood quite by chance. So Arthur Conan Doyle's first novel featuring Sherlock Holmes painted a rather alkaline wasteland with a fiercely self-protective society. The only other references were the speed records set on the Bonneville salt flats that I recall from my days obsessing over the Guinness Book. <laughs> What pictures the early days of the internet threw up seemed unreal. Majestic mountains with vast spans of land. It couldn't be more different from a flat, hot seaside town with 90% humidity, where a single neighborhood had the same population as Salt Lake. <laughs> Our early life was spent entirely uh, on campus, visiting national parks with every chance we got. As we knew it, everything was different the people, the food, the culture. But it wasn't hard to adapt to. We grew up experiencing some version of American culture on TV and the movies. So even though it was often exaggerated, we had some framework of what to expect and what the social norm was. What actually surprised us was how we were perceived by the average Utah. Most people were welcoming and pleasant to talk to, but a lot of others had never met a person from India before. I remember having to explain to my landlord that not everyone from India was scrawny and malnourished, and that I wasn't the only one to have enough to eat as a kid. I guess this is no different from my uncle in India who assumes every American has a gun and is wealthy. <laughs> I think when we have not never experienced a place for ourselves, we tend to remember only the most sensational version of the truth. This must be the reason why the notion of the border wall is most popular in states such as Nebraska and North Dakota, which are furthest from the border. Which makes me wonder if we should exercise more caution when we deliberate issues with the, which, which we have no first-hand experience. In our case, immigration was a matter of choice. We came to Utah and made to make our life, new life here. You do lose a lot by deciding to uproot yourself and moving to a new country and culture. You lose your sense of community, your own culture gets diluted, you never have a deep-rooted sense of belonging. No one you run into was friends with your grandfather or went to college with your dad. You soon start forgetting words in your own native language, and you start to forget what a good mango tastes like. <laughs> but you soon realize if, if if that is such a bad thing, can we not reshape our sense of community? Can we reinterpret our culture to incorporate everything around us, even if it means eating green jello and developing a taste for fry sauce? <laughs> we now find ourselves celebrating Diwali, which is the Indian Festival of Lights, and Thanksgiving with the same sense of tradition. And after 20 years, we, have, we find ourselves telling people that we're from Utah, and this always raises an eyebrow or two. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. It's nice to see you all. My name is Robert Broadhead, but you can call me Bob. I want to begin by asking a question. How many of you have taken a trip in which you walked 1,200 miles on a rocky dirt trail? My great-grandfather did so when he was six years old, Andrew Madsen. He was part of the Mormon Wiley Handcart Company. After traveling by boat, and train from Copenhagen to Liverpool to New York City, arriving Iowa City in June 1856. The Wiley Company then had to delay its walk for a full month. 
They had to delay because no preparations or hand carts had been made for them as promised by the Mormon church. They had to make the hand carts themselves out of green timber. The Wydah Company began its walk in July 18th. After walking 300 miles to Omaha on relatively flat ground, the company had to decide whether to winter over or to continue on. By then, the green hand carts had already begun to fall apart, and winter was just around the corner. A high church official urged the company to keep the faith and proclaimed, the Lord will keep open the way before us, and we should get to Zion in safety. The company departed Omaha in the middle of August after repairing the hand carts. Andrew was traveling with his family, his father, Oli, aged 41, my great-great-grandfather. His mother, Anna, aged 34, my great-great-grandmother. And three sisters, aged 16, 13, and 10. By mid-October, the company reached Devil's Gate in central Wyoming. It was snowing. The company went up the Continental Divide then and scaled five miles of Rocky Ridge in a howling snowstorm. The night of October 23rd, Andrew's father was assigned sentry duty to protect the company from wolves. In the morning, they found Ole, dutifully standing at his sentry post, leaning on his rifle and protecting the company from wolves and frozen solid. Ole Madsen and 12 others were buried that day, October 24th, in a common grave. There's a marker at the place of their death in Rock Creek, Wyoming. On November 9th, the Wiley Company dragged itself down Immigration Canyon in four feet of snow. The whole company looked like Holocaust survivors. All of the Madsons reached Zion, except Ole. Andrew grew up and eventually went on four rescue missions to save other immigrant companies. Andrew settled in Spring City, married and fathered 11 children, all with one wife. Although he remained a Mormon, he never practiced polygamy. Andrew and Anna celebrated 55 years of marriage in 1936, just before Andrew died at age 86. Ole, Andrew, and the whole Madsen family participated in one of the worst tragedies of the American pioneers. But as Danish immigrants, their story is a perfect example of the story of America. It's violence, struggle, perseverance, and vision. A country that was born out of the pain, hardship, and idealism of its immigrants. Thank you for letting me share the story of my great-grandfather.
Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly all your life. You were only waiting for this moment to arise. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these sunken eyes and learn to see. All your life, you were only waiting for this moment to be free. Blackbird, fly. Blackbird, fly. Into the light of the dark black Blackbird fly, blackbird fly, fly into the light. Blackbird fly, blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly. Oh. How good it is to be together in this time and hear these stories, breathe them in, and let them become a part of you. As we do so, let's take a break now, greet one another in friendship, accept this morning's offering in gratitude, and especially welcome our visitors today. Good morning. morning. Paraphrasing writer Elena Garro, which was the day, which was the jaguar that left me sitting on this balcony looking into my own self? My name is Balan and I came from Mexico. I was a serpent surrounding the elephant's footprint. I was a swimming jaguar, a foreign poet trapped in mountains and evaporated ice, licking salt. Still, I inhabit the man who surrenders to cobalt and jade waters of a tranquil river. Posing as writer without a voice, 
who claims a muted voice. Privileged immigrant that doesn't recognize himself on the faces of his fellow expatriates. The Maya deserter, gestated in a strange place, bullied past, uncertain of continuing. My physique form as Mexican with Lebanese heritage, a lone gone boy, crying wolf and craving death. Sweet was a guy who flew to this country from the land of agave and sea coral, anterior prestige, alone in isolated forest, past bohemian candor, inherited wealth, dissipated, sweet, no longer. Why here? How come I literally pick up the garbage at a printing company instead of portraying a character on stage? When did I stop writing, ferociously reading and aspiring, daydreaming about dark rooms with a dim light and silver? Because the agave was empty, the jaguar drowning, and the serpent preferred only circles. Here, without disappearing, rescuing meaning by giving life to my friend with a kidney, being laureated in my mother's tongue, Oceanic queens are still ashore, and my friends in front of me. Time still advances without running out. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Vicky Chavez. I'm from Honduras. I grew up in the second larger city in Honduras, San Pedro Sula. But it's also one of the most violent cities in the world. I grew up with my grandparents because my father immigrated when I had three months old and my mother when I was one year old. My grandparents were like my parents. In the year 2005, I was able to graduate from high school in quality control and production. Then before turning 18, I was able to start working to pay for my university studies. I work in managing small businesses and decided to study business administration. But I discovered that the career was too much theory and I'm not good at reading many books. I decided to switch my studies to engineering and production. It's more about numbers and practice, and I love that. Migrating to the United States was not an easy decision, but it was determined. Traveling legally was my first choice, but when investigating requirements, everything seemed impossible. May 31st, some people from the shore came to invite us to an event called Night of Miracles. I attend with a friend. I remember that I prayed to the Lord for a miracle of being able to travel to the United States, to know my parents, and especially to protect my girl. The way didn't matter, just to help me get there. Monday, June 2nd, I start traveling. The trip was very difficult, very risky. Half the way, Almost reaching Mexico, I was crying and felt I could not continue the trip. I want to return. People told me, do not give it up. We are halfway, you can do it for your daughter. And although I felt that I was falling apart, 
I only ask God to give me the strength to continue the journey and take my daughter to a country where she will be safe and with family. My two years old girl was always in my arms. I never gave her to anybody. On my back, I carry a backpack, backpack with the necessary essential to survive. In my arms, I carry my daughter's life. In my heart, I carry the desire to be able to hug my parents after 27 years. On June 19, after 27 years, I meet my mother and my whole family for the first time. I call, hug them, feel them, and tell them to their face how much I love them. Those were the most wonderful days of my life. Finally, one of my dreams come true. Hugging my family made me feel happy and complete. My legal case was always a battle. I had bad lawyers and the court system did not treat me well. My life was in danger in Honduras, but the court did not grant me asylum. I was left with no options. I told me I need to go back and I want to follow the rules, so I bought a ticket back to Honduras. But I knew I could not take my children back. We had been thrown so much and felt the love and support of my family here in the United States. I felt I could make this impossible choice to live inside the walls of the shore to try to protect my children. While we try more aggressively legal fights, I hope that the extra time here in the shore will lead to a good outcome for our legal protection. My biggest challenge is to fight with the laws of this country to show that we are here by necessity. Another big challenge is to learn a new language. It's difficult, but with the help of all the members and friends of the shore, I am managing to overcome the fear. Living inside the shore is not easy. I never imagined that I would pass through these moments. I have difficult days, and now more than one year. I have shed many tears, but I have also knelt to ask God for a stretch in this battle because I know that the day will come that we will leave the shore and be able to live in peace. All this time here in the shore, I have discovered that in spite of the difficulties, it has been a year of blessing. I have had the pleasure of meeting wonderful people who have told me that my life is worth fighting for. I know people here love my family. I know I'm not a professional singer and I cannot read music, <laughs> but people have even welcomed me in the choir. And I love to learn from Holly, David Sabrisky, and David Owens because they give me the opportunity to listen and learn from them. People have embraced me in the moments of sadness and depression. It's thanks to all of them that I am standing here today and telling me my story. It's thanks to them, my family and my daughters, that I am not a stranger and nothing can break that dream of staying together in this country with much security. I love this country because all the opportunities my daughter can have, they can walk freely, can run, study, and do what they like, like the most. I like this country because I am with my family and I can recover lost time. I think it's important to support immigrants and refugees in whatever way possible. I ask you to consider getting involved with organizations working for immigrants and refugees. Some organizations work to help support the immigrant community with rent, groceries, fundraisers, and even sanctuary. Getting involved goes a long way for so many people. Donations also go a long way. In this last year, my year of trial and blessing, I have met many people who have helped me see the world in another way. Now I know what the value of the family is. I have been thrown many roads full of rocks, but I have learned with each one of them to be strong, to fight for my dreams, not to let me fall, for bad advice. I have learned that 
If I fall once, I get on and do not stumble again with the same stone or in the same way. I had to fight. I learned to have strength and to have patience to make everything go well. This year, I have struggled, but I have courage because I have the support of a large family, this church, and the community that now supports me. Thank you. Hi there, I'm David Owens, and uh, I decided that first service, I'm way outside my comfort zone up here. <laughs> I, I'd much rather be down there. <clears throat> I suppose one of the hardest aspects of my experience with the immigration process has been that as I'm beginning, or well now I guess about a year and a half into a relationship, when uh, at this time, you really want to be spending time with the beloved other, we can't. Um, distance, visa regulations, endless forms and applications, work scenarios, and costs all present or prevent us from that happening. And oh boy, the costs. Um, at about $1,600 a plane ticket and 13 hours of flight time, date nights are pretty expensive. <laughs> And coupled with the jet lag that usually follows, date night performance anxiety has taken on a whole new meaning. <laughs> I hope I don't jinx any part of our process by talking about this publicly, especially about stuff that just isn't done yet. And that's kind of the gist of my words here about our immigration process. It just isn't done yet. By no fault of ours, it's just the daunting process of, I guess, the bureaucracy of these kinds of things. So differently than what some of the others have spoken about with their histories and kind of what is going on, Kathleen asked me to speak to the grinding mechanics of the immigration process itself, of which I, we currently, find ourselves being grist for that mill. That we, as most of you know, um, is me and the handsome Romanian you've seen in our midst for about the last year and a half. He is currently back in his home city of Bucharest, Romania, um, which until I met him, I probably knew about as much where Bucharest and or Romania was as most of you do, <laughs> other than we do know that Transylvania is stuck somewhere in the middle of it. <laughs> and so we have a little bit of historical context there. Um, the other thing that has been wildly exciting to get to know with him is how vastly different um, our culture is here than a post-communist country that is still um, developing wildly day by day. And um, Adrian was actually almost grown um, when uh, the Ceausescu regime fell. So that's quite interesting. Our grinding that we go through is this thing called a K-1 visa. And that's the document that the US government provides with um, uh, foreign nationals who wish to become married to American citizens. Mostly, at least in our experience, the, the uh, process has been hurry up and wait, um, which just goes on and on and on, because it really does kind of put your life on hold, and that is both costly and stressful. Following Adrian's graduation from pastry school in Bucharest, we have found over the last year and a half that realizing that if he has the chance, we want to get him over here to be with me, he's been really unable to secure uh, a job there in Bucharest that has any kind of security and, and can give him some stability because we don't know where he's going to be and so we just kind of hang out there. Um, also, when he's here, he of course can't work because he doesn't have a green card. And the way the government has these processes set up is you have to be very careful what column of visa you're in. And if you're a student or a visitor or a, a fiance application, you don't want to cross the lines about what you do and don't do, or you can wind up in quite a bit of trouble. Um, and he won't be able to get a, a green card until his 
approval for the K-1 visa. Once that happens, hopefully he'll have his interview in Bucharest and he'll be processed through, which is a horrible word that they apply to us. Um, but uh, that's what will happen and he'll get his approval and then he'll also get his green card and he can come back to Utah. Once that happens, the thing that they tell us is that we will then have 90 days to get married. And that's what we're looking forward to. Thank you. but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These things we carry in our hearts until we are together again. While this isn't the uh, national anthem, some of it, some of us no, it is the unofficial national anthem. And uh, it was written by Catherine Lee Bates, about all I know. 
I'm uh, Phil Josman. I'm uh, playing the Suzuki SCX48 chromatic harmonica. Any errors and omissions are that of the performer and not the instrument. <laughs> Nancy Rasmussen wants me to remind everyone that we have a very active refugee resettlement committee in this church and that they have a table in Elliott Hall. Uh, please stop by there. There's a lot of work that we can all do together. And in the meanwhile, we can enjoy coffee and conversation. Thank you. <laughs> 